Good morning. Uh, today we are starting a brand new series. I'm just kidding. We're still in the book of Acts. Um, we started in January working our way through the book of Acts. And last week, uh, we kind of got to zoom in on a guy named Philip. And one of the things that is really important to know about Philip is that he really wasn't the star of the show. Philip wasn't an apostle. Uh, Philip doesn't become a guy that we read a whole lot about in the future. Uh, Philip is what we like to call an ordinary guy who is filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And because of that, God used him in an incredible way, namely to take the gospel to the Samaritans. The first time the gospel begins to move among people who aren't just Jewish. It's this incredible step towards our history as the followers of Jesus. And we're picking back up with the story of Philip, but in a different setting this morning. And I'm really excited. We're going to cover a lot of ground this morning. So please grab your Bible. If you don't have one, there's one underneath the seat in front of you. Uh, we're going to hold our Bibles up and say a creed together before we jump in. And so we invite you to join with us in that tradition this morning. Let's proclaim this together. Here we go. The Bible is the word of God. The truth of the Bible will change my life. Lord, open my heart and awaken my mind and give me grace to respond. Change me for your glory and my joy. Amen. Please turn to Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 8. If you're using one of those Bibles from the seat in front of you, it's page 862. Acts chapter number eight. For those of you who've been with us since January as we're walking through this, uh, this morning we're gonna read the whole story and then circle back and walk through it. So instead of kind of doing a verse at a time, we're gonna look at the big picture and then zoom in together. So picking up in verse number 26, we left off there last week. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, doesn't that seem like we're missing more information? Like said how? Like, did you see him? What did he look like? I would really love more information in this verse. But just like Philip, the angel isn't the star of the text. Jesus is. So it's sufficient to read, an angel said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. Not a desert place. Some of you were like, sweet, they went to Andes. No, a desert place. Verse 27, and he rose and went, because that's what you do when an angel talks to you. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch. On your own time later, you can Google that if you don't know what that is. A court official of Candace. Queen of the Ethiopians, Candace is not a name, Candace is a title, kind of like Pharaoh or Caesar. She was a Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians. And this Ethiopian was in charge of all her treasure, just for perspective at this time in history, people smarter than me tell me, Ethiopia was not just what we think of if you look at a map of Africa today, it was not just a country in East Africa, kind of in the middle of the continent. No, they think it was where we see Ethiopia today and the entire way south, like all of Southern Africa, East and West, all the way south. This was a humongous region, and that's only worth noting to say this is a very powerful man. He's the secretary of the treasure for this incredibly powerful uh, economic and political power here, Ethiopia. He had come to Jerusalem to worship, which is interesting. An Ethiopian had traveled around a thousand miles to Jerusalem to worship the Jewish God. That's interesting. He was returning, seated in his chariot, and when we picture chariot, we might picture from the movie Gladiator, or maybe if you're older from the movie Ben-Hur, I'm not trying to date you, um, we picture the chariot, the little maybe one or two person thing. Probably what's meant here, historians would tell us, is what you may have pictured in other movies where people are carrying someone who's seated up on a platform and they're carrying this person on their shoulders. That's probably more likely what's meant by the word chariot here which is really impressive when you think of a thousand miles, right? 
but whatever. That really has nothing to do with anything. What's important is he was reading in his chariot the prophet Isaiah, which makes this story even stranger. It's strange that someone from Ethiopia would go to worship the Jewish God. The fact that he apparently owned at least the third scroll of Isaiah. We think at this time in history, there's three scrolls for Isaiah. And apparently he had his own copy. It's unheard of. You, you didn't have your own copy of any portion of scripture at this time unless you were incredibly wealthy. And you had to be really, 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 really wealthy if you were not Jewish and you owned a portion of the scriptures. So this is a pretty interesting guy. The spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet, uh, Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, this is such a good question, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I? Unless someone guides me. And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So if this was the kind of chariot that you carry, <laughs> that makes that far more interesting. And then the men resented Philip. No, I'm not just kidding. Um, verse 32, now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. And those of us who are the followers of Jesus have the great benefit of looking backwards through the gospels and looking at the cross as we read this prophecy from Isaiah like a sheep that was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him because he was innocent. There was no justice here. And who can describe this generation for his life was taken away from the earth. This lamb, this innocent lamb is silently humiliated. He doesn't defend himself. And his life is taken from him. Praise his name. The eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? About himself. Is the prophet prophesying of his own future death? Or, this is, that or is really important about someone else. Who's the lamb? Such a good question. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus, the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. Beam me up, Scotty. That's from Star Trek. I guess if you're under 35, you don't know what that reference was. Sorry, my bad. But the eunuch, this, this, we'll, we'll circle back to this. This is actually where we're going to end up at the end of our talk this morning. He went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus. And as he passed through, he did what he did everywhere else. He preached to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Look back up again to verse 35, because this will be our springboard into uh, our time in the text this morning. Philip opened his mouth. 
starting with this scripture, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Our global missions focus for this year is the phrase, speak Jesus. What did Philip do when given the opportunity? He was sitting next to a guy that clearly God was working on his heart because he's asking questions that we don't ask unless the Holy Spirit's working on us. And the first thing he did is he opened his mouth and began to speak Jesus. Because here's the deal. Whether you go to the prophet Isaiah or to any other chapter or any other verse in any other book in the Bible, here's what it all has in common. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus because the Bible is just like everything else we've encountered in the human experience. It's all about Jesus. And it only makes sense when it's all about Jesus. Life doesn't make sense about me when it's about me. Life doesn't make sense to me whenever I'm trying to figure my finances out with me at the center, my career with me at the center, my relationships with me at the center, my meaning or my purpose or my fulfillment isn't found in me. It's only found when I understand that it ain't about me, it's all about Jesus. And so what he did with this scripture is actually not unique. It's what we're supposed to do with everything we encounter in life, let alone the word of God, run to Jesus. Center on Jesus of Nazareth and then we'll have understanding and then we'll have some clarity to our confusion. It's all about Jesus. And I would say this, I just recently had a conversation with another pastor who's just struggling about some decisions to make at their church that have to do with with style and music and dress code and whatever, and their church is just so obsessed with stuff. And I just said, dude, it's about Jesus. Like if we're obsessed with trends, you know what's gonna happen in 30 seconds? We're gonna be untrendy. <laughs> but in 60 seconds, you'll be trendy again because it all comes back. So just hang tight. And I keep saying this about our remodel. There's coming a day we're gonna put some stained glass back in here. We're gonna have pews, man. I'm gonna be in a suit and tie. We're gonna have a choir. Let's go. Because who cares? It's about Jesus. What comes and goes is not the form or the fashion or the trends. It's about Jesus. And, and we're not trying to make Jesus trendy. We're not trying to make Jesus cool. Our mission in this generation is not even to make Jesus relevant. It's to make him known. Because when we know the person of Jesus, everything else will fall on the line. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It ain't about us. It ain't about our generation. It ain't about our moment in the spotlight. It's all about Jesus. And when it's all about Jesus, we see some pretty incredible things in this text. See, Philip didn't turn that on in that moment. He heard a question and he did the Sunday school answer. Is this about the prophet Isaiah or someone else? Jesus, right? When in doubt, just answer Jesus to any question you could ask. He goes to Jesus. <sighs> Guy's life has changed. We don't turn that on in that moment. That's where our life needs to be oriented to where when we find ourselves in Gaza in a conversation with somebody we don't even know, we just speak Jesus because we're living a life that's centered on the person of Jesus. So here's the first thing we see in the text. Go back to verse number one. Angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's a desert place. And you know what he did? He rose and he went. When, when it's all about Jesus, we go where he says to go. We go where he sends. And we realize that there's never been a moment of our life that we looked down and saw our feet somewhere other than where God had a purpose for us. Wherever we find ourselves, we believe Jesus is up to something here. I'm not here by accident. I'm here on purpose. And Jesus sends him. And the town of Gaza at this time was a dirty town. It was a dusty town. He calls it a desert place here. That term doesn't mean like uh, dry sand and, and cactus or whatever. It's literally the idea of it's, it's a place nobody wanted to go, right? Like he, he's in this undesirable place and he travels 165 miles to get there by foot, 
And in that town, and this is where I need our church people to turn on your Sunday school hat, right? That town is occupied by Philistines. You know how you read the Old Testament and it's like, they went out to war with the Philistines and then there was peace. And then they went out to war with the Philistines and then there was peace. And then they went out to war with the Philistines. Like every page, they're at war with the Philistines. So if you've not ever read the Old Testament, here's the summary. They don't get along. Right? And, and, and so he's not just like, oh, I'm traveling 160 mile, uh, 65 miles to a place nobody wants to go to. I'm going with people who hate me, right? And he travels by foot. That's about the same as walking from Fort Worth to Austin, just north of Austin. Speaking of a place that nobody wants to go, where the enemy is, okay, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even care. Yeah, whatever. So for those of you who are like, God would never call me to go to Austin, um, it's about the same distance as walking from Dallas to Broken Bow, right? If that makes it less orange for you. Um, that's quite the walk, right? And he catches up with someone who's like midstream on his thousand mile journey. So there's a lot of supernatural things happening here because when we're all about Jesus, we just go where he sends. I don't believe you are where you are today on accident. It's not the kind of God I serve. You don't sit in that cubicle on accident. You don't stand in that classroom on accident. You don't work on that assembly line on accident. You don't drive that truck where you drive that truck on accident. We serve a God who's intentional and he has you where he has you for a purpose that's all about him. He's up to something. And the reality is, the reason I live in the 817 is because I think God placed me here. Now you finally understand what the church stood, what the shirt stood, uh, stood for. There you go. Those of you who are like, I have no idea what that means. Melissa DeMent was like, that's my birthday, August 17th. <laughs> Melissa, it's about Jesus. It's not all about you. <laughs> he's placed you where he's placed you for purposes that are bigger than you. We go where he sends us. J.D. Greer, when he preached this text, the, his sermon title was The First Short-Term Missions Trip. <laughs> In the life cycle of the church, this is the first time somebody was like, I'm gonna go to a foreign mission field. He went to Gaza with a bunch of Philistines to have a conversation with a guy he'd never met. When it's all about Jesus, we go where he sends. When it's all about Jesus, our mission is to love the person in front of us the best we know how. Man, I, Holy Spirit, let somebody hear this with our hearts. If you're looking for a mission statement in life, here's the mission statement. Love the person in front of you the best way you know how. Because there's not a single person you'll ever be in front of on accident. And there's not a single person you'll ever be in front of who doesn't need to experience the love of Jesus. What if our mission on life was, I might get a lot of things wrong today, but I just wanna love the person in front of me the best I know how. I believe our culture is starving to death for some people who love Jesus and love people. And whatever our calendar's full of today, the thing that overrides all of that, the lenses through which we do all of that, is I just wanna love the person in front of me the best I know how. He shows up and meets this guy, this, this guy who's confused and searching and the reason that's amazing is because of what we talked about last week. And if you missed last week, here's the summary. They went to Samaria and God showed up and huge crowds are coming to faith in Jesus and they're seeing like revival and this incredible experience. And then God says, hey, Philip, I want you to walk away from all of this. Walk away from the crowds? Walk away from all the fruit? Yes, because there's one person that I'm drawn to myself. We serve the God who leaves the 99 to pursue the one, which means as the followers of Jesus, we're looking for the one too. Every person we come in contact with, we're like, hey, are you the lost sheep? I just wanna be a part of your story, man. I want you to know Jesus. Just love the person in front of you the best you know how. That's the heart of Jesus. I want us to go back to, 
to verse number 31, when Philip asks him if he understands it, right? And his response in verse 31 is, how can I understand unless someone guides me? That's such a good question. Because the answer is, you can't. Our purpose statement as a church temple exists to guide people to life change in Jesus. Because that's what followers of Jesus do. We don't save people. Jesus does. We're just a guide. We're just walking shoulder to shoulder with people towards the person of Jesus. And Philip is like, hey, I'll walk with you towards Jesus. I'm going to love the person in front of me the, the best way I know how. And here's what's amazing about this story. We, the first character in this text is an angel. But God doesn't send the angel. He sends a person who's experienced Jesus. God uses saved people to save people. How bonkers is that? He lets us be part of the story of rescue for other human beings. He doesn't need us. He could do something totally different. He could have sent that angel. I wish we knew more about the angel. He could have sent the angel. He doesn't because he uses ordinary people who've encountered Jesus to love one person at a time towards himself. That's what he does. And maybe, just maybe, the most difficult coworker at your job is somebody that Jesus is chasing after and he stuck you in their life so that you could be a guide. The next stop on our tour is your guide is Jesus. Maybe that's your role. Maybe that's why you are where you are, God's sovereign plan of saving a, a people unto himself, and he uses other people in that incredible journey. When it's all about Jesus, we go where he sends, and we love the person in front of us, the best way we know how. Truly, the when I think about legacy stuff, like what's gonna be said about us at our funeral one day or whatever, that phrase, what if somebody said about you on your last day, they just love the person in front of them? What an incredible legacy. When it's all about Jesus, we love the people who bear his image. Here's the next thing we see in the text. When it's all about Jesus, we listen for the voice of God. Because the first person who talked to him in this story was an angel. But the second time we see somebody speaking to him, it's in verse 29. The Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit of God, told Philip to go and hang out with this guy in the, in the chariot. The Holy Spirit of God spoke to him. And I believe he's still talking to his people. And again, we don't get much context here. Did the Holy Spirit speak out loud? Was it kind of just a stirring in his heart? Did the Holy Spirit bring to remembrance the words of Jesus? Go make disciples. Did the Holy Spirit allow him from a distance to hear him reading Isaiah? Clearly the guy was reading out loud. How did the Holy Spirit lead him to do this? We don't know, and I love that the text doesn't tell us because the way we work is we'd be like, that's the only way the Spirit speaks. The Holy Spirit speaks to his people. Now here, the voice of God will never contradict the word of God. So when the Holy Spirit said, hey, go love on that person, is that biblical? 100%. Come alongside and help somebody understand the scriptures. Yeah, I think the Spirit would say something like that. And sometimes he does that through a stirring or through a longing or through man. It just makes sense. Here's this dude reading the scriptures, asking questions. He looks confused. I mean, that just makes sense, right? Sometimes the Spirit speaks through those really broad ways. And the question today is not, is the Spirit speaking to his people? The question is, are we listening? Is our life so full of noise? Is our life so full of self that it drowns out the voice of God? That's the question. I believe he's speaking. Are we listening? The primary way he speaks is through his word. Are we listening? 
He speaks through the counsel of godly people in our life. He speaks through what, what he puts in front of us and we see an opportunity and we go, man, I didn't make this happen. I just found myself in Gaza and here's somebody who has quite, we find ourselves in a moment that we know was directed by the Holy Spirit. And I believe that's how we love the person in front of us best. As we're listening to the Holy Spirit saying, how do I love on this person? What, what do you want me to do? Because sometimes what he wants you to do is just wait, just be a friend. Don't start, if you were to die today, what's your name again? I don't, build a relationship first, right? Yeah, anyways. The, uh, one pastor said the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the book of Acts 59 times. And 40 of those times, he's speaking to a person. Sometimes he's doing some special stuff but around 40 of those times, he's talking to a person. I believe the Spirit's still speaking to his people. Are we listening? When it's all about Jesus, we go where he sends. We love the person in front of us the best way we knew how, listening for the voice of God. And here's the next thing, and we're gonna park here for a minute, and then we've got one more point after this. When it's all about Jesus, we go public with our faith. When it's all about Jesus, we go public with our faith, specifically through the ordinance of baptism. This text gives us a pretty amazing picture of baptism. And so we're gonna park on baptism for a minute and address some things about baptism that we've not talked a whole ton about as a church family, at least not on a Sunday morning. We believe that baptism is a a big deal in our faith. It's the first step of obedience in our faith because Jesus told us to. We see a great picture of it here in this text. We're going public with our faith. And I want us to notice, look at verse 38. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? I love that question. Man, God's been speaking to my heart. I'm hearing about the story of Jesus. I'm hearing what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Okay, is there anything that would stop me from being baptized here? He asks to be baptized. And here's why I think that's really cool. Somehow in the last like four years, maybe five years of our church's existence together, doing life together, we've transitioned into a space where people don't tell us they're ready to be baptized until we announce Hey, we're going to have a baptism Sunday. And then someone will say, I'm ready to follow Jesus in baptism. But biblically, I don't think you're supposed to wait on us to ask you. I think you're supposed to say, I believe in Jesus, and I believe the next step is baptism. Right? Now, we'll keep scheduling it and give you the opportunity to respond. <laughs> but I'd love it if you went, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, and I'm ready to be baptized. Some of you, you're like, hey, I've been a follower of Jesus for a long time. I just don't know if I'm ready to be baptized yet. Dude, it's the first step. It's the first step after you give your life to Jesus. It's baptism. We're going to talk some about why. Now, some of you, as you were following along in your Bibles this morning, may have noticed that we read verse 36 and then verse 38. And we didn't read verse 37. Maybe if you're following along in your Bible, you're like, hey, we, we missed a verse here. Why? If you're using one of those Bibles from the seat in front of you, you'll see it at the bottom of the page as a footnote. It's still there. It's just at the bottom of the page. Maybe the translation you're using, it puts it in brackets. Or maybe it's stuck, it's smack dab in the middle of the text with no explanation. I want to explain why in case you noticed it's missing. And we're not going to get super nerdy about scriptures, whatever. Just hang with me for a couple minutes. We're allowed to think on a Sunday morning, right? Is that cool? So if you look down at the bottom of the Bible, if you're using the one from the seat in front of you, it says this. It says, some manuscripts have all of this verse or maybe part of this verse. And here's the verse. Because he said, what prevents me from being baptized? It ends with a question, right? And then there's this verse. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So the question is, Pretty much every modern translation has that with brackets or a footnote. Why is that? Because the, 
the older manuscripts, there's been a ton of discovery of more of uh, older manuscripts. So if, if we're reading a book that's been translated for a long time, the reliability and, and, and credibility is the closer you get to original copies, right, the more credibility that there is. Well, the oldest copies that we found don't have this verse. And the first time we see it show up in the manuscript, it's written in the margin. It's not called a margin, but for lack of a better term, it's written in the margin. As though a scribe, who's copying this by hand, by the way, this is, this is a thousand years, 1,200 years before the printing press. So a scribe is writing and goes, this ended with a question. There's no way that Philip ignored him. Let me just give some context. Based on everything else the Bible teaches, a conversation probably went down something like this. So he wrote it in the margin to help bring greater understanding. We think. That's the theory. We don't know. No one's ever actually talked to that scribe recently. Something like that is, is perhaps why, which is why it's still in there. It's just like, hey, maybe this will help make sense of this to you. So here's the deal about verse number 37. It might not be in the best manuscripts, but it is in the best theology. Baptism, we believe, is for those who believe in Jesus. What would prevent you from being baptized? Faith in Jesus. So it is a good answer to the question. Whether it's supposed to be a margin or a footnote thingy or whatever, I don't know. But it's spot on with the rest of what the Bible teaches about baptism. Some people are like, but the, they took this verse out of the Bible. These modern translations are heresies. Because there's a couple verses that say, don't take anything away from the Bible. That's true. There's also a few verses that say, don't add anything to it. So we're trying to be cautious here by just saying, hey, we have more information available to us in this generation. That means we steward it well. We're not sure whether this was a word of man or a word of God. And we want to show that there's a difference between those two things. Despite what you may have heard from some pastors, their word is not the word of God. Here's the deal about baptism. All right, that's, a, that's enough textual criticism for the moment. Let's, let's talk big picture about baptism. I'm gonna use some very general terms. And so if, if you grew up in a different theological tradition and you don't think I say this well enough, give me a little grace here. I'm gonna try to stay big picture so that we can move quickly. I'm gonna give three categories for what churches believe about baptism. Category number one, baptism is necessary to go to heaven. Baptism is necessary to be saved. They might even would say, baptism is part of what saves you, right? There are some that would teach that once you place your faith in Jesus, then you better get baptized to seal the deal, to close the deal, to finish your faith, to com complete your faith in Jesus. And until you do that, you're not fully saved. There's another category in this belief system that would say, if you weren't baptized in the right church, that's the right denomination, as an infant, then it's gonna be really difficult for you to ever get to heaven one day. So you better let us baptize your babies. So it's necessary to be saved. That's view number one. View number two say, no, baptism doesn't save you, but it is a sign that you belong to a family of faith. This is a view that would say, we believe the sign of the old covenant was circumcision, which was for a family, males only. If you don't know what that is, you can Google that right after you Google eunuch. And if you have a, I'm, I'm, this is restraint, happy Mother's Day. <laughs> this view would say in the new covenant, the new sign of a faith family is baptism. And so just like in the old covenant, it was something that the leader of the household chose. The leader of the household chooses, we want the sign of our faith in Jesus to be for the whole family. And so they believe that that is for infants then. And, and they would not say that it saves you. Later, you're gonna have to come to your own 
uh, understanding and your own proclamation of faith. This is just how we show that we're raising you in a faith family. It would be the same thing that we call baby dedication, just with some water. That, that would be category number two. I have some dear friends in this category. We just differ on this view. They don't think it saves you. They just think it's part of the new. And most of my friends in this category are like, we think. We think this is what it is, but we hold this with an open hand and we're gracious about this and whatever. So baptism saves. Baptism is a sign for a family. Here's a third category. Baptism speaks of our faith or shows our faith. Saving faith in Jesus is displayed through baptism. After we're saved, after we're born again, the first step of obedience to Jesus is we show that we have placed our faith in Jesus, which is what we believe here at Temple. We believe that when a person gives their, uh, gives their heart to Jesus, gives their life to Jesus, is saved, is born again, they show the world that by walking down into water, saying, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he was physically buried and then he bodily rose from the dead and that alone is my hope. I'm only trusting in the work of the cross. I'm only trusting in the shed blood of Jesus. Baptism doesn't wash away my sins. The blood of Jesus washes away my sins. And it doesn't matter what my parents believed, what denomination I am a part of, what, what uh, denomination I grew up in, whatever. No, it doesn't matter what I say, do, think, or feel. It matters what Jesus Christ has done. My hope and my faith is only in Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is what we call the gospel. My faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ alone can save me. You can see I'm a little more passionate about this one. And I'm displaying that physically through baptism. That's what we believe about baptism. By the way, around the world, the followers of Jesus, the reason that baptism is such a huge deal is they can give their life to Jesus in secret, but they're risking their life in some cases by going public with their faith, by being baptized, right? And this is what we believe the scriptures teach about baptism. Real quick, I'm gonna talk through some of the reasons that we believe that. This debate around baptism has been around for a long time. Like within about 30 or 40 years of this text that we're in this morning, we already see that there's disagreements in the early church about baptism. Because the Apostle Paul, who next Sunday morning is gonna become the Apostle Paul, next Sunday morning will be in Acts chapter nine. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter one. Dude's like just out of the gate. That's the only Kentucky Derby reference I have. He's just out of the gate and he tells them, stop arguing about baptism. Knock it off. You're like, I'm in this dude's baptism camp and I'll, well, I'm in this dude's baptism camp and it's way better than your baptism camp. He said, knock it off. He said, I don't want anything to do with that mess arguing about baptism. And these are the words he uses. He said, Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So the greatest church planner who's ever lived said, baptism isn't my goal. Preaching the gospel is the goal, which means we respond to the preaching of the gospel and we're saved. So baptism is important. It's connected to our faith, but clearly it's not the same thing. Does that make sense? That make sense? Okay. Here's something else that makes a lot of sense to me. Jesus got baptized. But Jesus never got saved because Jesus was never lost. Because Jesus never sinned. Right? I'm just making sure we're on the same page with that. Otherwise, next week we might delay Paul and talk about the life of Jesus for a minute. Okay. <laughs> Jesus got baptized to send a message to us. This is what it looks like to follow me after you're a part of me. The thief on the cross is one of the things people point to a lot when we're talking about category number three. Jesus tells him, today you will be with me in paradise. It's just foolish to think that somehow he was baptized before he died. And apparently that day he was with Jesus in paradise. In Acts chapter two, when the Holy Spirit's poured out, it said they received the word and then were baptized. So it's responding in faith first. 
That's what saves us, right? In the book of Galatians, in the book of Ephesians, in the book of Romans, the repeated theme is we are saved by grace through faith and not works. And here's how much work baptism is. It took me three tries before I got it right. True story. The first two times I was scheduled to be baptized, I refused to get in to the baptismal pool. I stood at the top of the stairs and said, nope, and turned around and walked away. And my dad was the pastor in the baptismal pool. It's a true story. <laughs> and it wasn't stage fright. Have you met me? Like, it's not because people were watching. That's the only good part about it, right? <laughs> yeah. I was terrified of whatever I was, I don't even know, but I believe I was born again. It took work for me to muster up the courage to let my father baptize me, which means it can't have anything to do with me getting to heaven because I am not my savior in any way, shape, or form. I'm my biggest problem, not my biggest solution. It's all about Jesus. Jesus, oh, the night he was betrayed, as he's breaking the bread and passing around the cup, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. There was no punctuation, but there'd be a period if there were. Forgiveness of sins is because of the broken body and shed blood of Jesus, period, not through what I do about it. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing before Jesus had even come out of the shadows yet, preached repentance first. And then the last, last thing I'll share is this. One, one of the clearest summaries of how a person is saved is Romans chapter 10, verse number nine, says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Not if you confess Jesus, believing in your heart, and then find water and an appropriate person who can baptize you, then you will be saved. That is not the biblical teaching of baptism, in our opinion, here at Temple Ministries. Now, this middle ground where it's a sign for babies, right? A sign for the family, is the mode of baptism of sprinkling, right? Because why do, why do them Baptists just like to dunk people? What's the deal with that? There are very, very, very few, but there are some pastors who will immerse a baby in infant baptism. It's very seldom, very rare, and I think child abuse. We believe the mode of baptism sends the story of who it's for. Because we believe the, the biblical picture of baptism is that you're immersed in the water showing the burial of Jesus and his resurrection. You can't do that with a sprinkle. Now, the language of the sprinkling of blood is biblical, but not related to baptism. Some scholars believe the word baptize actually means to immerse. I don't know for sure that that's completely spot on, but I, there's some truth in it for sure. And one of the pictures is here in this text, verse 38. He commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water. If he was gonna sprinkle him, they could have stayed on the chariot, right? Now, they could have stepped down into a puddle, but that's probably not how the language would have read if he was sprinkling him. And then in the next verse, it says, they came up out of the water. That implies that he went into the water and came up out of the water we believe baptism is by immersion, showing the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But the point of all that is, when it's all about Jesus, we go public with our faith. And some of you, the next step of orienting your life around Jesus is that you need to be baptized. And so the challenge this morning is not, hey, here's when we've scheduled baptism Sunday. The challenge this morning is, let us know if you're ready to take a step of faith and follow Jesus in baptism. So when it's all about Jesus, we go where he sends. 
When it's all about Jesus, we love the person in front of us the best way we know how. When we are all about Jesus, we're listening for the voice of God. When it's all about Jesus, we go public with our faith. And then here's the last one. When it's all about Jesus, lives are changed forever. I want you to see the end of that verse. You know, Philip is carried away. But this Ethiopian eunuch, he went on his way rejoicing. Before he heard about Jesus, he was confused. He was lost. And then he encountered Jesus and he was rejoicing. How great is that? Like, man, I got nothing but questions. And then he met Jesus and he spent the next 1,000 approximate miles rejoicing. That's a changed life. We believe that only Jesus can satisfy the longings of the human heart. He met Jesus. We said our, our purpose here is temple exists to guide people to life change in Jesus Christ. Like Jesus loves you too much just to say, hey, you'll get to heaven one day. Good luck in the meantime. He's literally setting us free from the stuff that's draining life of us right here and now. He's replacing sorrow with joy and bondage with freedom, confusion with hope. He's in the business of changing lives. The question is not, hey, did you pray a prayer when you were a kid? It's where do you see God at work in your life today? We believe he's in the life change business, which doesn't mean we never sorrow. It doesn't mean we never function in bondage. It doesn't mean we don't stumble. It doesn't mean we don't fail. It just means we're on this trajectory towards Jesus that's better than life looked like before that. That we're orienting towards a life that's centered on Jesus, that's changing us. That's the hope and that's the mission. This guy went home rejoicing. Do you wanna know why? He traveled a thousand miles in a chariot to Jerusalem. Do you know that's about the distance from here to Disney in a chariot? That is the exact distance from here to Jacksonville. I'm not taking Garrett to college in a chariot. It's bad enough I have to ride in a car with him. A chariot, have you seen how he... That all better than for me. He traveled a thousand miles to get to Jerusalem. And we're told that there was a sign at the temple, not in the inner court, in the outer court, outside the outer court that said, no lame, no blind, no eunuch may enter. He traveled all that way just to be reminded that he was an outsider. He already would have felt like an outsider being an African at the Jewish temple. And then he was told, you're not welcome here because you're broken. And then he met Jesus. <laughs> this is the beauty of the presence of God. This is the beauty of the one who ripped the veil of the temple and said the outer court isn't good enough. Come into my presence. He went home rejoicing, which by the way, I just love that picture that a, a Jewish man is sent to the presence of an African man surrounded by Philistines. That is so cool to me. Like racial reconciliation is not some new trendy idea. This has always been the heart of Jesus. And he went home rejoicing. His life had been changed. He had a new meaning, a new freedom, a new acceptance. And the, the ancient historian Eusebius tells us that he went back to Ethiopia and started the first church in Ethiopia that started thriving and changed the whole world. That's what God does. He encounters broken people and he introduces them to Jesus through other broken people. And they finally get to experience some joy. I wanna share this illustration real quick and then I'll be done. 
I've been waiting for weeks for an opportunity to share this story, and I want to share it this morning. A couple weeks after we started this series, and we're talking about speaking Jesus, and we started having some of our global missionaries in to share updates with you. One of the missionaries that came and gave us an update was our missionary, Ginny O'Kelly, who's no longer Ginny O'Kelly. For the first time, we got to meet her husband. It was really great to, to because I had never met him as well. I had not been to Romania to see her during the pandemic. So is the first time as well that I got to meet. His name is Stefan Bacholiu. And so Ginny is now Ginny Bacholiu. If you didn't follow that. Um, and here's the thing about Stefan. He's Romanian. And here's the cool thing about Stefan being here in our worship service as a Romanian. When our service was over, he got to talk to a lady named Maria. Maria started attending our church last summer. Maria is from Romania. She's really smart. She speaks Romanian, German, English, and a fourth language that for the life of me I can't remember, but who really needs to know when there's four? That's just ridiculous. She's just showing off. But the one that she says she speaks the least fluently is English. And God brought her here to Fort Worth. She would sit here every Sunday. She's now in Washington State. But she would sit here every Sunday with her phone out, with Google Translate on. When I would say something that didn't make sense to her, she would look at her phone because it was translating as I talked. And she tried so hard to, to feel like she was part of the spiritual family. But it's just different when there's a language barrier. And then Stefan showed up. And I watched her go talk to him after church and I had never seen her body language look like that. She was so animated. She was so joyful. I have no idea what they were talking about, but they were into it, man. And it was kind of like she felt like, man, their spiritual family seeing me for the first time in this worship place. It was such a beautiful thing to see. And the reality is, maybe you don't work with people who speak a different language than you, but maybe they are a world away from Jesus. And what if he's placed you into their life to speak Jesus in a relevant way that makes sense to them, that isn't shaming them or judging them, it just meets them where they are. And what if the result of that encounter, because God placed you in their life, is that whenever your paths part one day, they went away rejoicing <laughs> with the joy of Jesus, just because God stuck you in their life. That is how God changes the city. That's how God changes lives. And I just wonder today, who has he placed in your life so that you can just love the person in front of you the best you know how, filled with the Spirit, listening to the Spirit, believing that you're not in that moment by accident, but on purpose, a glorious purpose, that they might experience joy in Jesus Christ.